Hi, I'm Chris Sarandon, and welcome to Cooking by Heart. I couldn't believe the tastes and the flavors. Lydia Bastianich. Hi, Chris. Susan Sarandon. Where we revisit the vivid memories of the food we grew up with and the people and the stories attached to that time in our lives. I was the one sort of like Mommy Dearest. <laughs> <laughs> My guest today is Lucy Arnaz. Lucy is a veteran of 55 years in show business. She's appeared on Broadway and London in Lost in Yonkers, Pippin, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, and they're playing our song, among others. And she has starred in First National Companies of Seesaw, Whose Life Is It Anyway, Social Security, and Pippin. Her television appearances include The Lucy Arnaz Show, Sons and Daughters, The Black Dahlia, and Here's Lucy, opposite her mother, Lucille Ball, and her brother, Desi Arnaz Jr., and she's made guest appearances on Law and Order, Sons and Daughters, and many other television series. Her films include The Jazz Singer with Neil Diamond and Laurence Olivier, for which she received a Golden Globe nomination, and also the films Down to You and The Wild Seven. She's produced and starred in Babalu, the music of Desi Arnaz for the 92nd Street Y, and has appeared in her show, Lucy Arnaz, or I'm sorry, Lucy Live, at Feinstein's At the Nico and The Purple Room. She's performed the opening number of the Academy Awards and performed at the White House. She executive produced the I Love Lucy 50th Anniversary Special, which received an Emmy nomination, and Lucy and Desi, a home movie for which she won an Emmy Award. And she served as executive producer on Aaron Sorkin's film, Being the Ricardos. With her brother, Desi Arnaz Jr., she manages Desi Lu Productions. I'm very, very happy and very proud to present Lucy Arnaz. Hi, Lucy. <laughs> Hello, Chris. Thank you for <laughs> oh, having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So, well, we always start the show uh, with provenance, with where we're from. And uh, as, as a good many of us, we have a sort of well-rounded provenance in our lives. Where did you start? Where were you born? I was born in Los Angeles, California, mm -hmm. Cedars of Lebanon mm -hmm. Hospital. And we lived first in Chatsworth, California, out near Northridge in the Valley, right. until I was about four. And then they it was their fourth year. My parents were in show business, as you might Oh, know. really? <laughs> and so they wanted to move a little closer to where they worked. Mm -hmm. So the schlep from... Chatsworth to Hollywood downtown was not fun anymore. Right. And so we moved to Beverly Hills. So then I grew up in Beverly Hills at 1000 North Roxbury Drive mm -hmm. for the better part of my life. Mm -hmm. and we moved to New York for a little time of during that period when my mother was in a Broadway show right. called Wildcat. Mm -hmm. And then we moved back. I got my first apartment in Los Angeles and I moved out when I was 18. I got married very young, mm -hmm. stupidly. and But I always have been California till... Until about 1978 or so. Mm -hmm. Well, 74, I bought an apartment in New York after I did a show mm -hmm. uh, called Seesaw. And then I, I was by coastal And then I met my husband, and we lived on the East Coast for 40-some years. Oh. So, But basically, a California girl, and back to California now. Yes, right. I live in the well, you were kind of a, a sort of neighbor adjacent to us. Uh, we live in Connecticut. You guys lived in neighboring Westchester, right, for a while? We lived in Westchester for 26 years, but then we did move to Connecticut. We moved oh, right. even closer to Right. We wanted to be even closer. I know. So we moved to Westchester. And yet you and I never actually met. How is that? I, That's it's crazy, nuts. right? It's nuts. They're, Not even a party yeah. somewhere. That's like, and, and, but yeah. a very narrow degree of separation between us. Indeed. If it wasn't for Joanna, I never would have had the opportunity to do Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Right. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> because she, she was leaving. You know the story, yes. of course. And, uh, I was doing a show in Florida, and I was booked for six more weeks, a brand new play at the Coconut Grove Playhouse. So I thought, damn. And I had seen that show, and it was so freaking funny. Mm -hmm. And she was so wonderful in that role. And it wasn't an audition. You could just have the part if you want Ooh. it. And I'm not available. Isn't that always? Available? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she found out. And so she said, oh, well, okay, I'll stay another month or so until she could get here. So oh, that was really I cool. had no I idea she it. did that. She's She is she an did. extraordinarily very nice lady. Yeah, she very generous woman, I must say. For those listeners and watchers who don't know who the heck we're talking about, that's my wife, Joanna Gleason, 
Tony Winter, Joanna, Joanna Gleason. Gleason right, Sarandon. Right. So I'm going back now in time. Uh, okay. So tell us, first of all, mom and dad, Lucy and Desi, whom we all know. But now they were both working parents, right? Yeah. So as you were growing up, who was in charge of food? Who, who cooked for the family? Cooks and my nanny and my grandmother and people who were home. Mm -hmm. You know, very rarely did my mom and dad cook on the weekdays. Right. I want to say like Monday through Friday when they were working mm -hmm. or sometimes Monday through Thursday later on, they had it down to a science after a while. Uh, we had, uh, you know, people who worked for right. us in the kitchen. It was a lot of Willie, people named Willie May. I had two Willie Mays. Oh, really? And and uh, Francis Calhoun when I was much younger, and they were wonderful, wonderful cooks. And and I would, you know, constantly be in the kitchen trying to figure out what they were doing. And I would, all, I was always told to stay out of the way, but not by them, by my mother when she came home. Get out of the kitchen! Get out of the kitchen! Get, 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 get. It took me a long time to have the nerve to try to cook anything because right. I wasn't able to watch. Oh, interesting, interesting. So so let's get back to the sort of everyday. So what was everyday. what was that cuisine like? Did it change depending on who was doing the cooking? A little bit. It, feel, it felt like we had a staple of, of menus uh, growing up. And it was a kind of a, a wonderful mishmash of the things my dad used to like to cook and they learned to cook, like uh, arroz con pollo, ah. or, you know, which is like yellow rice and, and chicken. chicken. Right. Um, or, or picadillo, which is a ground beef chopped up the, with potatoes and onions and garlic mm -hmm. and stuff. And uh, And my mother was true to her roots, which are nine generations, Mayflower, you know, American. All American. Literally, her her distant relatives came over on the Mayflower. They're on the manifest. Mm -hmm. So it was corned beef and cabbage and chick chicken and dumplings, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, uh, corned beef, hash, mm -hmm. Simple American stuff, nothing fancy at all. Now, when uh, when when mom and dad were working, time. were they did they make it at home in time for dinner, or were they basically not usually? Yeah, so in the early early days, with that show, they were so inventing the process of three camera live audience film right. that I don't remember being at the table with them except on holidays and in weekends, weekends when we would probably go away to our little house in Palm Springs, mm -hmm. which is where I live now. Or we would, during the summers, we'd be at the beach in Del Mar, California. And then my dad would cook more often. And then we'd have these wonderful barbecues mm. and all of his food. And once in a while, my mother would put stuff together. She would be like more the person who would make breakfast and lunch. You right. know, she could do some pimento cheese sandwiches. or And uh, we loved to have picnics. So somehow the food got made. But we had, we always had help. Mm. My mother never went anyplace just by herself. Right. There was... A, a person for us taking care of the kids, and there was always somebody helping in the kitchen. So it's hard for me to know who cooked what when I was little. Mm -hmm. you know, were yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, it, it, were there any specific favorites that you had when you were when you were younger that you remember very vividly that some of the people who worked for you guys cooked? Yeah, I mean, uh, and even if they were my grandmothers, my grandmother, my mother's mother, Dee Dee. Oh, she was around um, too. Was, she was around a lot, and she had not been around when my mother was growing up because um, her husband died, and she was like 20 years oh, old, wow. and she had to go to work with two young children. Oh. And so um, she worked all day, and my mother's grandmother and great-grandfather and grandfather took care of them, but they had to learn how to make all the food and all themselves. Mm -hmm. She grew up way too fast. But so then when my when we came along, my grandmother tried to, I think, sort of make up for it right. for not having been there. She was working all the time uh, for, by taking care of my brother Desi and mm -hmm. I. And and she was she cooked for herself at her house up until she passed away at age 86. She was taking care of herself all her life. Very pioneer, salt of the earth woman, mm -hmm. you know, cursed like a sailor. <laughs> and, uh, like a chef. Right. She wasn't gourmet, but there wasn't anything she didn't know how to put in the skillet and make, mm -hmm. you know? So when she was around, I was allowed into the kitchen. And I remember, you know, she made a great chocolate cake that I don't eat a lot of sweets. And Dee Dee was her name, yep. did not allow us to have a lot of sweets. She was very health oriented, but for everybody's birthday. So that was a couple times a year we'd have birthdays and Dee Dee would make this famous chocolate cake that was so delicious. Mm. I just 
remember. It, it was a tradition in our house. Chocolate, and I have pictures. Chocolate frosting and interior, or no, it was a deep chocolate fudge, the kind that's real moist and has holes in it. It's so oh, moist, yeah. you know that kind. Oh yeah. Oh God. And that was a white Cairo syrup frosting, almost like a marshmallow, like a marshmallow frosting. Oh. It was unbelievable. But the pictures of it are the ugliest things you've ever seen. It wasn't high and beautiful. Right, right. And, you know, it was like flat cake and she'd throw a couple candles on it, but it was killer delicious. And I lived for that. She also taught me how to make a really great salad dressing, believe it or not, with red leaf lettuce mm -hmm. and oil and vinegar and just a little pinch of sugar ah. on the after you make yeah, the dressing yeah, yeah, yeah. and you toss it, just Dash, dash it with a little bit of sugar goes into the salad dressing. Such a great trick. And, you know, she made great fried chicken and brownies and just, I don't know. I still have some of her recipes of the things that my grandmother liked. Persimmon cookies, like persimmon, persimmon cookies. cookies. Someone knows what to do That's, with those. Whoa. My grandmother knew what to do with persimmon. Wow. She made pomegranate jelly. You know, I mean, it's, it's another. Do you era. remember, do you remember uh, uh, stories of where she grew up? Well, yeah, she grew up in Jamestown, in Jamestown, New, New York. York, where my mother was. Ah, in New York, upstate, that's where the that's where the comedy center is, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Upstate New York, and uh, growing all their own vegetables, you know, and having pigs and chickens in the backyard, and that's why I say pioneer, salt of the earth. Right. It was, you know, nineteen the nineteen hundreds, the late eighteen hundreds and nineteen hundreds, and um, and she she. Knew how to do all of that stuff, but then she didn't get a chance to do it for a lot of right. years and, and brought it back. But she could make, she also, um, she had this amazing cookbook that was just tattered by the time I got a, it into my hands after she passed away. Right. And they still make it. It's called the Settlement Cookbook. Mm. And it's, I think the uh, first time it was published was like in 1826. It's crazy old. I'm writing that and down. It, it's the Settlement yep. Cookbook. Got it. And, and it's been republished a hundred million times. Right, right. And now I have the new version, but it has a lot. Of, and it's just basic, basic cooking, basic right, how to do everything. Right. Sort of like, so, sort of like that, that uh, uh, better homes and gardens. Joy of cooking. Yeah. Or the yeah, joy of cooking. Yeah, home and gardens yeah. and the joy of cooking. Yeah, my mom grew yeah. up with the, with the better homes and you gardens. You got to have well. a basic book. Yeah. How to boil an egg. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah. like. But to this day, I go there to go baked apples. What's how do you do a baked? And I go to the settlement. Oh yeah, and it's just basic stuff. And it was it was ingredients without all the fancy right. stuff too. You know, yeah, yeah, basic. Yeah, except for persimmon. I, I took them. Well, those we still sell them. <laughs> just nobody knows what to do with them. No. <laughs> so, so then, <laughs> still growing. So then. So then, uh, so there you were, was your grandmother, Dee Dee, right? Dee Dee, yeah. And uh, so she was around a, a fair amount of the time when you were a kid? Yeah, but she was always there when my parents couldn't be there if they were off on a trip oh, or something. Okay. Or she had to take us to go buy school shoes or uniforms yeah. or whatever. It would be Dee Dee who would have to take us right. and go do that because my folks worked Yeah, yeah, time. yeah. And then as she got older, we ended up giving her a driver, Frank Gorey, who was amazing. And I don't know. They, they, she wasn't really too old to drive, but my dad got scared that maybe she was. Yeah, yeah. She was like in the late sixties. It was nothing. And, um, but he got her a driver. And so then we all went out, Dee Dee and Frank and us. Right. We went out right. to go do all of our stuff. And she was, so she was there a lot. Mm -hmm. I loved it because when Dee Dee took care of us, when mom was away on the weekends or whatever, whenever she was gone, she would make breakfast for dinner. And that was ah, always fun. Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. You want to have pancakes yeah. tonight? Should we have scrambled eggs and pancakes yeah. and bacon? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Such an adventure like really for kids because they, they're so used to routine. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And we also did this thing in the morning with Didi. It's, you're bringing this all back to me. When we would sit and have breakfast with Didi before school, she would have black coffee mm -hmm. and real coffee, not decaf. Right. I don't even think they had decaf in those I don't days, think so either, you know, yeah. It was black coffee, yeah. and we would have some toast with butter on it, and we'd do this thing where I would go, dunk, Didi, and she'd go, Okay. And she'd push the cup over, and I'd dunk my buttery toast oh. into her coffee. There was nothing better, uh -huh. and I, I still don't like black coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was nothing black, better than that. black coffee. Black coffee didn't even have sugar in it. Whoa! And but my little toast, my little Pepperidge Farm yep. white, no preservative toast mm -hmm. that my mother used to buy, mm -hmm. buttered, and just dunking it in Dee Dee's coffee. And see, I like to do that when I was a kid because I, my my parents. We drink coffee in the morning, obviously, 
Uh, but I, I remember uh, with them, it was, I think it was my mom who liked a kind of cafe au lait sort of coffee. I mean, I'm giving the fancy yeah. word for it. It was basically coffee yeah. with milk. Coffee with hot milk. Coffee with hot milk and sugar. And I love to dunk yeah. toast into that. That was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still do. Oh. So it's still pretty well, good. Well, thank right? you for bringing that back to me since you just uh, pulled it out of your past. Uh, so then well, you mentioned that dad cooked. Now you you also, you also talked about arroz con pollo. You talked about uh, the other dish. What was Picadillo. it? Picadillo. Uh, Picadillo were those... and the big roast pig. He would do the big oh, roast pig. Oh, really? Roasted on a spit. Yeah, whether it was over our little, you know, rotisserie barbecue in the kitchen, mm -hmm. or when he had a ranch years later, he had the ranch hands. He would give them like a case of beer every hour, not a case, like a six pack right. every hour to keep the crank moving. And he would put it on. And it's unlike they do in Hawaii where they, you know, put it in a pit yeah, in yeah. the ground and they right. tea leaves and stuff. Yeah, yeah. They would do it ab above this fire mm -hmm. and hit that full roast pig for like, I don't know, they roasted it for like nine oh, hours. Oh yeah, a long time. Hours. You've got to roast it that way. All day yeah, long. Right. Those guys were so drunk, they had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> right. As long as their arms were still ambulatory, they were fine. Like, right. Pork or cork? We don't know. <laughs> Any other specialties of your dad's that you remember? What I remember about him is that he could make a dinner out of nothing. Mm. He would he would have done great on chopped, you know, yeah. when they open the basket and you have to make right. gummies yes. and, and yogurt. What, right. He he could open up what I thought was an empty refrigerator. And I'd say, Dad, there's nothing for dinner. And, what do you mean? There's nothing for dinner. <laughs> and he would open up the refrigerator and find a few bits of this mm -hmm. and a little couple of those vegetables and one piece of leftover mm -hmm. this and make the most amazing little stew or soup or saute of it. No recipes. I don't think he ever used a recipe. I never saw him open a recipe book. He just cooked. Right. And I don't know where he got that from. Well, that was my next question. Where Where did it come from? I have no idea. Be I think probably they had to learn how to do that when they lost everything after the revolution ah. in 1933 in Cuba. Yes. Batista came in and my fa my grandfather was the mayor after of Santiago. That, after that revolution. They lost everything. Right. I mean, houses were burned to the ground and they had to come to this country as exiles. Mm -hmm. And they lived in a warehouse with nothing. And then they had to figure out how to survive. Right. So whatever little bits of food and stuff that they would get, I think he got very clever. Cubans are pretty clever people, mm -hmm. you know, and very, they are, they are intuitive and, and they can make do, they can make stuff out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And so he, and then he just sort of taught himself, I guess he likes to cook. You have to really like exactly. to cook. Otherwise exactly. You just go somewhere and get fed. Yep. He really liked it and he loved to fish. So his, his, he always cooked these you know, amazing dishes with any kind of fish mm -hmm. that we would cook. Right. I have great pictures of him. We had a boat down in San Diego and we would, he would take us out and then we would go to a little beach somewhere and take the fish that we had caught early in the morning right. onto the beach, make a fire. And he would bring like everything he needed to do that. He'd have a, like a chopping board and the knife and a little grill and a, a pan mm -hmm. and salt and pepper and lemons and garlic and onions. And he would float the little, the little chopping board in the water while he swam behind it all the way up to the beach. And then he'd get on the beach, <laughs> dig a hole, put the, all the, you know, wood in right. it, light it with matches and cook lunch for us with the fish that we just bought on the boat. Heaven. Uh, I mean, and what a, what, what, memory. what a wonderful picture that is of him I pushing that, have the picture. of him pushing the, I actually have a picture of him. Because oddly enough, Chris, mm -hmm. years ago, I decided to start putting together these ideas, just like what you're talking yeah, about, yeah. to do a family, family cookbook yeah. and ideas and recipes and things like that. So every time I would open up something, I would, oh, you probably can't even see, can you see that? Oh, yeah. Could push a little closer so everybody can see it. Oh, that's great. Look at this. Oh, Isn't that funny? Fabulous. Yeah, and and uh, I I start finding these things and it reminds me of these stories mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it. I'm going to write this. I'm going to write this oh, you book gotta. about just kind of what your show is. It's memories yeah, and exactly, recipes. exactly. And by the way, people around food, yep. people and food and family and that. Exactly. And, and these times that you guys had together, that is when they were home for the weekend or if they were home on a Friday yeah. when they were only working four days. Yeah. Uh, what was it like around the table? What was the conversation like? That's a good question. I'm trying to remember of that for the most part, because when my father left the house, mm -hmm. when, when they got divorced, I was only six and uh, a half years old. Yeah. So 
I have pictures of those times and I have memories of Del Mar and, and memories that are very sort of highlights, like a little shadow yeah, and a snapshot go on this and that. Yeah. But it's hard for me to really remember mom and dad talking at the table. Mm -hmm. For some strange no. reason, I have more memories of the later years with my mother and my stepfather, Gary Morton, right. and that we would. I know that they never talked about politics or uh, usually it was just things that happened that, that day, day and talked to us. Yep. They talked to us a lot because they were busy so often that when we would get together, we would get a lot of questions. Yes. A lot of questions. <laughs> My, my mother even had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder where she would interview Desi and I. Like, you're interviewing mm. me? And I was like five years old at the time. Wow. And he's three and a half, and she's interviewed. Now, now, little Lucy, little Desi, <laughs> how did you spend your day today? And we have those yes. tapes. Yeah. She wrote, on the, she wrote on the box, my precious tapes. Uh, oh, and how and, great um, that you still have them. And I still yeah. have them, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of us, particularly in the in the in the culture that we're in now where everything's disposable that i don't think people except in their cameras in their phones um they take a lot of pictures but the whole yeah. idea of there being family history and sitting Ugh. down and talking in the family about the history uh yeah. you know one of my great regrets is not sitting down and particularly my dad not sitting down with him and hearing about his early years the years that i spent with him i know but the years that I don't, when he struggled as a young man, uh, as a Greek in a small Turkish village, and then found a way to immigrate to the United States and found a way to open a restaurant on his own and then bring all of his family over. I mean, there's, there just, there's part of that history that's gone. Yeah. I mean, I'm very fortunate that both parents wrote an autobiography at one point oh, they did. in their life. My father, my father wrote about his life, especially his early life and the beginning of the studio and the beginning of the Al Lucy show. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Called a book by Desi Arnaz. <laughs> and we're actually in the process of getting it put back into print because it hasn't been in print for a really long time. Yeah. You can still get it online, but it's like $400 right. for a copy. Right, right. Book. And, and my mother at a later point in life also wrote about her life. So I have a lot of information from them about their early years. Right. And my father's story in particular, well, they're both had enormous tragedy oh. growing up. It's amazing. She came from like nothing mm -hmm. and just got poorer and sadder before she left to go try to make it in show business. Mm -hmm. My father had everything in the world, really lucky kid growing up and, you know, three homes and mm -hmm. lots of money and politics. And, mm -hmm. and then they and lost, they lost everything, everything and he was right. penniless. Mm -hmm. And they both ended up having to caretake their families because they became the breadwinners, bread you know, basically for the rest of their families mm -hmm. and try to have a, their first actual living experience, normal living experience together. But then all that yes. stuff happened. So it wasn't very normal. Exactly. Exactly. Probably. Well, let's get, but it is, a, it's a fascinating story. Yeah. yeah. The background. Oh, it, uh, it, it, well, it's always fascinating to me because uh, family history is, is um, uh, the richness. It explains a lot. That we all carry <laughs> forward and also that we need to pass on to our kids. But we'll, yeah. we'll leave that for now. So, so, then, okay. so then the time that you did spend with them together, uh, did you go on any trips with them? Well, the together? trips that we were mostly able to take, yes, we did some great trips. We took uh, a couple of trips that I remember so fondly in like 1957, 56, 57, to Hawaii mm. in the you know in the early fifties mid fifties Hawaii was just so special yeah very it's unspoiled still special to me now mm -hmm. but it's more a little more sad because it's become just another big rodeo drive in some places yeah. you know yeah. and uh, but back in those days we stayed on Oahu right at Waikiki and we were at the Ala Moana Surf Rider Hotel and the Penthouse and we have great home movies of that and they were so happy there it was such a happy vacation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have, but I think that's why I love Hawaii to this day, because my memories of Hawaii bring me great joy. Those were the times when they were the happiest. Mm. And we had our wonderful summers in Del Mar. And we had a rental house at the end of the beach in Del Mar, which we went to for several years mm -hmm. before they were divorced. Yeah. And those were beautiful times, yeah. really. Even though they spent some of the days in the racetrack and we didn't see them during the day, but that's okay. <laughs> we were on the beach, you know, Willie May or Dee Dee. Right. And, 
and taking naps. And then they came home and we barbecued and we roasted marshmallows and did the hot dogs. And it was oh, great, just like any other kids. That was the next question. Any food memories from there? But there you go. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And picnics. My mother loved picnics. Take us to the San Diego Zoo and bring everything. Mm. We had to bring the pimento and cheese sandwiches and the jelly and cream cheese and jelly cream sandwiches. Cream cheese and, and jelly. Fries. Oh, yeah. Cream cheese and jellies. By the time you got to eat it, the bread was purple. Remember, yeah, it was like, yeah. it was great. Always grape and jelly. Fried chicken, mm -hmm. potato salad, egg salad, all this dumb stuff. As a matter of fact, my mother loved picnics so much that she started listing all the things that she liked and remembered from her childhood picnics mm. when she was thinking she was going to write this autobiography. Yeah. Forgetting that she had already written an autobiography. <laughs> and so this was just before she passed away. And when she died, I was up in her bedroom, you know, looking at stuff like you do. Yeah. And I found this little piece of paper next to her bed that's a list of all of her favorite foods from the fabulous picnics that she remembered as a kid. Oh, and I went, oh, great. Thank you. How great. Because uh, I didn't know what to do as a memorial for her, for the family. Mm -hmm. Like she always said, I don't want a funeral. I don't want one. I said, okay, we're going to have a picnic and this list is what we're going to serve. And that's what we did. Do you remember so that? That's how much she loved picnics. Do you remember what was on it? Yeah, just that stuff I just told oh, you. Oh, okay. Fermented cheese sandwiches, right, okay. uh, baked beans, fried, you know, fried, fried chicken, chicken, potato salad, jello, like fruity jello, yep, yep. stupid old fashioned food. <laughs> now, what about once your mom had divorced your dad and was with Gary? Do you have any, mm -hmm. any, so you were a little older then. Any thoughts about yeah. what was going on at the dinner table there when you guys were together? Absolutely. First of all, I have. <laughs> I have memories of Gary coming into the house after my father had been there and, and, you know, he enjoyed eating and everything, but he was pretty much the cook and he was busy mm -hmm. and Gary showed up. And I have one memory of, of Gary and my, the people in the kitchen made ribs that night, I guess. And uh, they served the ribs and we all took ribs and then they came back around as they do. And we all took seconds, you know, took more ribs. Mm -hmm. And then Gary looked up and he said, are there any more ribs? And my mother went, more ribs? Like, who would have three? <laughs> so he became sort of famous for always asking for, for a third for... portion of whatever it is. And uh, he taught us both, my mother and I, how to make a great chopped liver. Mm. That his mother used to, because they were Jewish, so they had a nice, right. you, know, you know, how to do the chopped liver, right? Yep. I got to be very good at that. Mm -hmm. And he also did, um, he used to talk about his days as a bachelor and how he would have to get by and kind of foods that he would make because he had no time mm -hmm. and he had to cook. And he created this, this spaghetti with breadcrumbs. And I went, Ooh, Ooh that sounds dry and horrible. It's not, really? it's really not. You use angel hair spaghetti and you toast breadcrumbs with a lot of butter. Yep. And then at the end, you just toss the breadcrumbs with the spaghetti. You don't even have to put oil on it or anything. It's delicious, mm. especially good if you serve it like on a little side portion of it with like a veal scallopini or something. Mm -hmm. It was just delicious. He had very simple tastes too, you know, and he loved everything. I don't think there was anything that we served that he didn't like. But our, unfortunately, the biggest memory I have of those years, the Gary years of my mother in the dining room was that she, for some strange reason, liked to keep the TV on just low enough so that she could sort of hear it mm -hmm. and it would annoy everybody else, but it wasn't really loud. <laughs> right. Just little, those when they had TVs about yep, this big. Yep. And a lot of people and have them. A little like yeah, that nearby. Yeah, and it sat on the baseboard, and she used to watch Wheel of Fortune mm. every night. And you'd be trying to have a conversation, you know, uh, about your day or whatever. Right. Gary'd be trying to tell her something about the studio, and she'd be going, uh huh, uh huh. And she'd be eating, and going, uh huh, uh huh. And she'd go, Three little boys. Oh, I should <laughs> scare the hell out of you. Like, oh, what? She's just come out with the answer that all this time she's been really listening to the show right. and what right. the. <laughs> and scare the living daylights out of it. Well, Jesus, what? So that's the answer. Three little pigs. I knew it. I found the thing. Anyway, that's my one of my big dinner menus. Right. Uh, Remember. Yes. <laughs> Memories. Uh, Gary. Gary was in comedy. Yes. That was his. He was a stand-up comedian. Stock and trade. Yeah. Yep. Catskills. You know. Mm -hmm. And Andy opened for Sinatra and Sammy Davis and those guys. So he he had it pretty good for a while, and he was pretty funny. Kind of old-fashioned yeah, corny right, joke, but, right, you know. Right, right, right. Uh, Henny Youngman, School of Comedy. Yes, yes, but he told them well. Yes. He told them well. He used to do our warm-up at the Lucy Show, the Here's Lucy Show mm -hmm. and the Lucy Show all those years. Mm -hmm. And people 
people were laughing. I mean, he's today, I think some people uh, put him down. He's gone, so he can't defend himself. They tell, oh, he was a terrible Catskill comic. I said, he wasn't terrible. He was a Catskill comic, yeah. but he was, and, and there was pretty damn good, and, actually. And there was a sort of, there was not a sort of, there was a kind of classic comedy timing that has informed every com- comic since, exactly. regardless he, of what the jokes funny. were. Yeah. My mother would never have married a comedian who wasn't funny. Mm. I bet. Let's just put it that yeah. way. He could make her laugh, and that was important. <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, both during the earlier years and during the later years, uh, did you guys ever go out? To, to dinner? dinner? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, uh, we went out a lot. They had favorite places, the uh, places I wish were still there. I don't, I don't know if you remember any of those places, but on like, I think it was on Cannon or Rodeo, the Luau. Do you remember the Luau? Yeah, I didn't. I I didn't spend much time in Los Angeles there. until I was in my twenties and twenty. You know, later. Right. It was a wonderful t- Polynesian, Polynesian, very Hawaiian. Sort of like the t- Trader stuff. Trader Vicks. Vicks. Right. Right. Trader Vicks. Yep. Don the Beachcomber. Yes. Right. Now I remember and Trader Vicks. The Luau. Yeah. That we loved that place, and so we went there a lot for, until they closed it. Really. We went to Don the Beachcomber down here in Palm Springs. Mm. She went to Lord Fletcher's here in Palm Springs, which was like a place you could get old fashioned sort of roast beef and Yorkshire pudding mm-hmm. and things. And, all that. And, and later in the later years, when we would do the Here's Lucy show on Thursday nights, we would get finished filming the show early enough to actually get to dinner at a restaurant by 930. It's amazing. You couldn't do that today no. if your life no, depended no. on it. Shooting. They stay for 12 hours. Deep into the night. Shows. Yeah. It's nuts. We we rehearsed, we learned our stuff, we filmed it. Good night. We're gone. Mm-hmm. We have dinner. Yeah. And we used to go to Mateo's in Westwood, yes. which was uh, not a really cool uh, Italian mm-hmm. restaurant that everybody went to for mm-hmm. years. Any any during that time it, when you were a kid and you went out someplace, any sort of, oh my God, I've never had this before in my life. This is amazing. Food, yeah, you mean? Food. I felt that way about the luau. I really did. Oh, Those amazing little, uh, uh, God, the little triangular squares of minced. What the hell even was that? Were they dumplings? Oh, Sue Cameron will hit me right now if I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> it'll, it'll come to You'll me. Remember it. Remember You'll remember it. You'll remember it. It was a, like a duck, you know, pie, but it was a smashed duck with things on top mm-hmm. of it and um, to die for. And the way they did their rice. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Whether that I just went, oh my God, the apple pan. Do you remember? Oh the yes, apple pan? absolutely. Pico. Oh, Pico. I was just going to say Pico Boulevard. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah, still there. The best, the best little greasy hamburgers you could buy mm-hmm. any place in the whole. And did they have a, a, a pot pies as well? The apple pan. They had pot pies, and they made um, amazing apple a- and pies. regular apple you know, pies. Yeah. the apple pan because of their pies, but you go there for, for their hamburgers. Yeah. Go figure. Right. Uh, little place. And I used to love to go to the farmer's market, you know, over by CBS on Fairfax. Did you go there when you were a kid? Absolutely. There was all these wonderful little stores. You could go in and get a little piece of this and a little piece of this. Oh yeah. Farmer's market was great fun. For our our, uh, listening and, and, and viewing audience, any of you who ever make a trip to Los Angeles, if you don't go to the farmer's market, you're missing one of the great sort of core historical places in LA, first of all. And secondly, a great food experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, there were all the, like, the regular places you would stop at, the Bob's Big Boy or Dolores' hamburgers. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, we'd be allowed to do that. But like I said, my mom, because of my grandmother, Dee Dee, she had, um, she was like one of the very first naturalists. She she was all about pure food. Oh, really? And food, she understood the word preservative before anybody knew what she was talking Mm -hmm. about. And she, uh, her doctor was a guy named Henry Beeler, Henry J. Beeler. If you look him up, he was like the first food doctor. He was the first guy that if you went to him because you were sick, he'd say, all right, what, what have you been eating? You know, it'll be about the food. Joanna has you know? been making something for years called Beeler's Broth. That's it. Oh my God. Yes. I can't believe she just said, you said yes. that. Yes. Beeler Broth. Yeah. Well, there's, there's the green beans mm-hmm. and the zucchini. Mm-hmm. She, they, they always used to give everybody, my grandmother, no matter what was wrong with you, it's a green beans, zucchini. You buy a couple of zucchini and a big bunch of green mm-hmm. beans, clean them, smash them, put them in water, boil them, Cook them up. until they're 
stupidly smashed, you know, mm-hmm. soft. Yeah. And then smash them up, put a little butter in it, maybe a little sort salt of and pepper. puree them. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, but you could eat it regular without pureeing, mm-hmm. I suppose. It's, it's all the chloroform, chlorof- chlorophyll. Phil, I hope it's stuff. not chloroform. Chloroform. <laughs> it's not chloroform. No, that wouldn't be no. good. Chlorophyll. Right. Yeah. There's amazing uh, properties in those two things mm-hmm. that are toxin releasers. Mm-hmm. And so if you're getting something and you're not feeling well and you and you eat that, somehow just does a punch. Detox. And she used to also slice up lemons and grapefruits and throw them into a big pot, big soup pot. And and just let them cook down with a lot of water, right. so it becomes like a hot lemonade. Mm-hmm. And but they have the the rinds on them and everything. Mm. And then you would ladle it into. I still do this as soon as I start to get a cold really? or a sore throat. Ladle it into a big mug. Yep. Put some honey in it because it's a little bitter yep. otherwise. Uh, and it's so soothing. First of all, yeah. If you have a sore throat or whatever, but it's like a hundred thousand milligrams of vitamin mm-hmm. C because you get the rind and the you know the peel and everything. Right. And but Dr. Beeler, he would she would schlep us to where was it San Luis Obispo or San Juan ah. Capistrano somewhere way down there uh, where his office was. Mm-hmm. And if you had a lingering cold or cough, you'd go to him and he would make a little. Where have you been eating? Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Okay, there's okay. You have too much milk and dairy. That's why you have all this mucus. Right. You have to get off of that. You have to do. And it was all about that. And so my whole life, Dee Dee was always deciding. For us and for my mother, you know, with the kind of stuff we supposed to eat. Do you believe to this day I do not have a cavity in my mouth? That's extraordinary. Neither does my brother. That's extraordinary. Neither does my brother. We weren't allowed to have candy bars and soft drinks. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dee Dee's chocolate cake, that was like, oh, wow, big deal. And maybe a piece of candy for Halloween, one piece. Right. Pick one. Right. And she waited until I had uh, my first her second little tooth that was going to come out, you know, mm-hmm. the tooth fairy is going to get it. She said, no, I want to, I want to show you something. And so she took my little tooth after it fell out and she put it in about this much Coca-Cola and we watched it for about three days and it just got smaller and smaller until it became dust and wow. disappeared. And she said, now that's because there's a lot of sugar in that Coca-Cola. Now it isn't going to rot your teeth quite that fast. But it goes over, oh. the, it keeps going, you keep drinking it, and it keeps going over mm-hmm. your tooth, and it's going to slowly eat it away. That's an image. Like, Whoa. Wow. I don't want that. <laughs> no. So it just broke me. I was like, I wow. never had a, I, to this day, I don't have a sugar craving for anything. <laughs> God. It's really interesting. And Desi had, we were raised the same way, and to this day, he doesn't have a cavity. I keep saying, how is this possible that we don't have cavity? Yeah, that's amazing. Really amazing. It is. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. what was your? Did, was there a source for organic food? Was your mom into that, or was it more that the the organic craze hadn't occurred yet? Well, yes and no. I don't think the organic craze had occurred. Or it didn't have really. a name yet. It didn't have a name, but next door to us in Beverly Hills was Jimmy Stewart on one side, and then there was Jack Benny over here. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy Stewart was like two doors down there, but the people next door to him. Um, <laughs> this is the most ridiculous story. The, there was an earthquake and their chimney broke yep. and fell. On Which like happens a lot in like Los this. Angeles, right? And they never fixed it. They just left <laughs> it like that. And it was a big eyesore. Like, what are those people? Aren't they going to fix their chimney? Mm-hmm. So Jimmy Stewart hated it so much that he bought their house. <laughs> he said, I'm going to buy. How much do you want for this place? You know, I'll, 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 how much do you want? want? Yeah. You know, and, and they sold it to him. He tore the whole house down and built a garden. Now, it's like a two-acre garden. Wow. Okay? For his wife. Mm-hmm. And Gloria would go out there and she would cook. She had her vegetables. She had her flowers. She had citrus trees, everything. So Jimmy Stewart would bring us vegetables. Wow. So I guess in a way we did have organic vegetables because yes, we right. had our next door. Yeah, exactly. Oh, God, that's great. That's wonderful. <laughs> so then you left home. So by the time you were, you said you were 18, you, you went out on your own. Now, by then. I went out on my own. Were you cooking? Not the least of which. That was one of the main reasons I wanted to have my own apartment because I was tired of her saying, get out of the kitchen. You're in the oh, way. Oh, interesting. Like, How am I supposed to learn to do anything? Yeah. And I was already on the Here's Lucy show. So I started to make my own living when I was 15, mm-hmm. you know, and I put a bank account together and I was make, making some money. 
And so I thought, mom, I can afford my own apartment and I want to move out and I want to try to do these Mm -hmm. things. And she was, where are you going? And I was like, well, I'm looking for a place over here in Century City. I can find a little. And I did. And that was my first thing is I going to learn how to cook. And boy, I tell you, it was hilarious. Part of the cookbook that I almost wrote, but then I realized I didn't have enough of these stories because I started to actually learn how to cook pretty quick. Yes. But in the beginning, I made such ridiculous mistakes because I just didn't think like a cook because I hadn't been around them my life, right, you know. Right. And, and, just, and I'm going to put every one of those stories in this book. <laughs> but it would have been like a, a very short pamphlet at one point if I, <laughs> you know, if I hadn't gotten any good at it. Right. So then you were off on your own. You were cooking on your own. And then what happened when you got married? Well, I got married the first time when I was only 20 years old and oddly enough, made all the food. Willie Mae Barker, who raised me, and I made all the food for our wedding, which was 200 people in my mother's backyard. And we made empanadas and I put together all the shrimp and all of the dips and the little burger things that we made. And I mean, it was an outdoor buffet afternoon thing, but we made the food ourselves. It was important to me to have something to to make that we could make that I could help her make right you know? but also and, um, but also isn't it interesting how when we want to connect with people that that's one of the yeah. first things we turn to yeah uh-huh yeah i wanted to have something you know the whole thing was i wanted it at home i wanted it homey i wanted it to be real yeah and not, i mean it was going to be you know a hollow hollywoodish celebrity-ish enough mm-hmm. because of the people that of course were going to be invited right. and there's all those people in my backyard and it was a big, 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 big deal. But I, I softened it by, you know, making it just more like a pic, like a yeah. picnic. Obviously. There you go. And uh, there you go. And that was fun. And then, and then I started cooking at home for my husband, for Phil and making, you know, inviting his friends over and our friends and showing my, you know, abilities, mm-hmm. but there were, there were always, these disasters, you know, that you had to get over and then figure out, like, like artichokes. Do you like artichokes? Oh, we love artichokes. Yes. I love them too. And I used to grow up, I grew up eating them all the time, but I never made any. And so I wanted to make them for a friend of my husband's who uh, said, I've never had a, an artichoke. I said, you're kidding. Oh, my, oh, you're going to love. It. So I went out and I bought a bunch of beautiful artichokes and I I called Willie May, Willie May Bar. No, no, the first time I just looked up something about artichokes, mm-hmm. thinking I can do this by myself. And it said, you know, boil the water, a little bit of vinegar in the water to, gives it a nice tang, and uh, boil them for 25 to 30 minutes. I said, oh, okay. And so I brought this guy in for dinner, and, and I had special artichoke plates my mother got me for the melted <laughs> butter with the lemon in it and everything, and uh, put the artichokes in the water and Ding, the thing went off, right. and I said, oh, it's time. I took him, I poured all the water out of the pot, and I put all the artichokes on my little plates, and we set the table, we sat down, and I said, now what you do, Steve, is you just take one of these little leaves, you pull it off, and then you dunk it in the butter with mm-hmm. the lemon. And we all tried to do that. <laughs> but? <laughs> <laughs> None of the leaves came off the artichoke. Right. They were so undercooked, and I had already thrown away all the water, that, uh, like this yes, much Yes, right, so you can't pot. start all over, right? Not like I'm going to go, okay, I'll just, I'll be right. right. So that was a disaster. And then I called Willie Mae and I said, what did I do Mm. wrong? And she said, well, did you cover them? No, Mm. I didn't know I had to, you got to cover them, honey. You got to cover. So I, okay. And then I go back and somebody says, yeah, you, you, you know, cover them. And 25, 30, it's really like 40 minutes. Oh yeah. It takes a long time. Cover them 40 minutes. Okay. And, you know, and test them. Before you yes. take them out of the pot. <laughs> I said, right. okay. There right. are procedures. So then I make the dinner. Yes, I make the dinner happen again. And Steve comes back. And I go, Don't, I got it this no. time, right? So they all sit down to the table with my little artichoke plates. And I go in there and I take the top off. And I take my little tongs, you yeah. know, whatever. And I, whoop, came right off. Mm-hmm. Leaf came right off. Good. So I take the whole thing over to the sink. And I pour it all out. And all the leaves went into the sink. <laughs> <laughs> overcooked well, yes, now. The leaf came right, right off because it was overcooked. Yeah, yeah. So that was the second time. And then somebody finally said, no, Lucy, it's either 25 minutes uncooked or it's 40 minutes. I mean, uncovered. uncovered right. You know, 25 minutes covered or 40 minutes uncovered. Mm-hmm. You don't cover it for 40 yep. minutes. Right? And whatever you do, test it and then don't throw the water yes, out. Right. Just take the artichoke out. 
thing out and put it exactly, on. Exactly. Exactly. So that, you, you know. Oh, we, we love artichokes. I'll throw a little, I'll throw a little, uh, I'll throw a bay leaf in the water and maybe some fennel seeds to give it a little oh, yeah. kind See, of anise kind of yeah yeah bit. give it a little kind yeah. of flavor of its own uh, the whole oh meal. yeah uh, we love them uh, so so now have you since then and obviously now we are into the future you're married again you are uh, with your husband Larry who with whom you've been for a number of years um 43 yeah and your your kids did you cook with your kids did you teach your kids how to cook always i cooked yes i did and my daughter's a good cook, and uh, my son Joe can make up anything. He can put stuff together, and it always tastes mm-hmm. good. Uh, Simon is is a vegan vegetarian. Uh, he doesn't really even cook mm-hmm. anymore. He mostly just makes smoothies oh. and stuff. But um, yeah, we cooked all the time, and it was hard because I tried to be home more than my mom and dad were allowed to yeah. be. And both, again, Larry and I are both actors, right. and so we're working when we work, but it wasn't as you know, every single right, day. Right. And that. for years and years. But it was for, oh, on well, for more years. Yeah. yeah. Way more years we were uh, away and doing shows or, and you try to get them fed before you have to get into the car to, depending on their age to get to your work or, you know, feed them in the morning and then go out or not feed them mm-hmm. in the morning, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, but, but I loved it. I loved cooking. Cooking was my way, like you said, of reaching out of being with my family. It still yes. is. I, I, I'm not a gourmet cook by uh, any stretch of the imagination, but I like when people say, oh my God, this is really good. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever, whatever it takes to get that. Yes. And yeah. I, I'm repetitive. I find things that yeah. work and that people like. I think like, we all do. Yeah. I cook them over yeah. and over, but I'm also getting braver. Now, the more you cook, the more you understand why that turned out mm-hmm. that way or why it didn't work. And, and so now I'm I'm braver. I just try recipes off of TikTok or whatever as much as I can. You know? <laughs> especially, so, especially during the pandemic. Yes, I know? think we all did. In the beginning, yeah. it was bread baking, and uh, yes. yes, sourdough yeah. starters. Yes. <laughs> right. I'm going to hound you for a recipe because I asked oh, okay. for a recipe from all of my guests. I'll be very specific. Okay. I'll 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 send you some information about the. The kind of thing that I would like to, ha- not the, the necessarily the dish, but the format, because all of our guests contribute a recipe and we put them all together. We're going to put them all together someday. Oh, that'd be yeah. great. Let me know if you, if you want a certain recipe that like we have too many of these or we need more of this stuff and or whatever, because I got, I have a few. <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to conclude, Lucy, with a question that I ask everybody. And that is if there's a moment that you go back to uh, early in your life that's elicited by a smell or a taste, uh, and we're talking about memories, obviously, mm. something that when you, when you uh, enter a restaurant or when you sit down at a table and you smell something or you taste something and it takes you back to a particular meal or a particular moment early in your life that's centered around food, what would that be? You know, it's funny. Uh, I wanted so badly just to have my folks and my family around mm-hmm. at dinner time that any time we showed up together was memorable. Whatever so, it was. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. makes perfect sense. You know, I, I don't remember the food as the mm-hmm. thing as much as the fact that it happened with certain pr- people. Right. Right. Didn't well, we, that's what the show's about. I, I like having family around the table. I love Thanksgiving because of that. I love when the family gathers and it feels like home because so much of the time it we were alone, yeah. you know, and there wasn't a lot of family and a, and a lot of time to do that. Um, so I guess I would have to say any time that there was stuff being cooked for a big group in the kitchen and I could smell things mm-hmm. cooking, I knew people were coming. Yeah. And it was going to be great, yeah, yeah. you know, like that. It's it's the it's the whole thing. It's the smell of cook. It's the smell of of preparation. Yes. It's the smell of the onions and the and the green peppers being chopped and the garlic mm-hmm. and the the stuff in the frying pan that he was going to make uh, before he made you know the goulash or whatever. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. The, those things that had to that had to saute first to get it all going, and and that was a constant. It was always through my life when everybody 
was together and we were cooking. And and I love sharing my kitchen now with people. I yes. like to cook with more than one person in mm-hmm. the room and we all cook together. Yeah. That reminds me of talk talking that. and so, having a glass of wine and 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 yeah, oh, through the preparation. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And to this day, it feels doesn't feel like it's dinner time unless I can pour a glass of something, nice glass of wine, and go in there and go, okay, now what are we yeah. making? You know, it's like I like that whole the ritual is is Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's it. That's exactly the the answer of the question. That's, it. that's the yeah, answer okay. of the question. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I went right. I was like, oh, well, she was she that? was starting to sweat, folks. Uh, I was. <laughs> well, with that, Lucy Arnaz, I must say this has been a delightful, delightful time talking to you. Thank you so very, very much. much, Chris. It was my pleasure. Good to see you. Love to Joe. All right, Lucy Arnaz, thank you so much for joining us on Cooking by Heart. It was so much fun, and it went by too fast.